Hello, everybody. So today we're going to talk about um, medications and opioids. So something that I deal with quite a bit. I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a second to do that. It worked before, but it, oh, here it is. Okay, so um, this lists my objectives. And um, as stated on this slide, that by the end of the presentation, I hope you'll be able to describe the prevalence to opioids in older adults. And then also discuss some alternatives to opioids. And I have to say, I expanded about that a, a bit about how to safely use opioids as well um, to treat pain in older adults and when to do that as well. So starting out, we know there is an opioid epidemic and I think we haven't heard about it as much since COVID struck, but it's still going on. I am happy to say that Ohio, um, has ranked fifth rather than second in the nation as far as opioid deaths. Um, and that data was from 2018, which is the latest data that's available. Uh, and they did decrease their ranking from 2017 when Ohio was second. So in Ohio in um, 2018, we had 3,980 opioid related deaths. Um, and then I actually, on the Ohio website, there were, was data that talked about 2019 data, so it went back up a little bit to 4,028. And we do know that in 2019, so specifically for the opioid deaths in Ohio, that fentanyl or fentanyl analogs were often related. So 76.2% of the deaths in Ohio were related to fentanyl, um, either in combination with another opioid or by itself. Uh, we also know in Ohio, the overdose rates from um, opioids increased among people more than 65 years of age. So we had a 23% increase from 2000 to 2019, but really the number of deaths in this age group is quite a bit smaller than the deaths in the other age groups with, for example, um, 153 opioid related deaths in people over 65 years old in Ohio. And it was interesting to me that over half of it, just a little bit of over half of them were also still involved with fentanyl which is usually really relating to more of an abuse type of situation that's going on. So getting into what is abuse versus misuse. So misuse is what we think about when a prescribed opioid is used in a way that was not prescribed, while abuse is where there is really an intent for some effect of that opioid um, to have that psychological or physiological effect that the person is actually seeking to get. So misuse may be that a patient's pain is not quite controlled on what we're, we have given them and they decide to take an extra dose or a higher dose. Well, abuse is really that intent to basically get the effects, the psychological effects. So I'm gonna kind of put it out there and I hope somebody will read the chat for me. Maybe Sue Hazlett, you'll be willing to do that. But what are common causes of opioid misuse and abuse, would you say, in our, and especially in our older population? I think it's hard for me to see the chat. Does anybody I'll, I'll have... look at it. I'll monitor it, Sue. Me Thank I'll you. Want memory disorders. Someone says pain is not controlled. Yes, very good. So those are two definite ones. What I have listed on there, and I didn't put the memory disorders, but definitely memory disorders for our older patient are one I would say on the list that I, uh, I often have patients even just, they don't think twice about it, that they've adjusted their pain medications a little bit for uh, what they feel their needs are, but then there ends up being an issue when they go to refill that. Um, we, depression and anxiety are certainly reasons why patients will tend to use more opioids. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, how those are all related. And then we do, I mean, certainly we can get older patients that become addicted to the medications and are actually um, feel like they are using those medications just to get that feeling. And another thing that we might not think about for older patients, but I have definitely heard about that 
older patients might sell some of their uh, opioids to uh, get some money. So to pay their, what they need uh, for one thing or another. So usually when I have heard about this, it's not a, a large scale thing. It's more of uh, they're funneling some of their oxycodone to someone who sells some and gives that back to their, back to them, them the income. So there are, we can't discount that that may occur in older patients. So, so, so Ken, I'm going to, one last one, used as first round of list of options was another comment in the chat box. Oh, okay. Thank you. Can you say that again, Sue? I didn't quite hear the whole the, thing. Used as first round of list of options. Okay. All right. So that's a good point is that um, not using something else before you try that opioid. So, um, so how big of a deal are opioids in older patients? Approximately 50% of patients over the 65 years or old do report some persistent pain. So that's pain that lasts more than three months. Those with mood disorders are twice as likely to, to actually be taking uh, opioids as well. But really only three to 4% of all adults are prescribed long-term opioids. So there are laws that kind of Many of these laws are fairly new within the last few years to try to decrease the amount of opioids that are, are out there that people can misuse or abuse. Uh, first, in acute pain, we now, um, if somebody goes and has surgery, only a seven-day supply of medication. Sometimes there used to be a lot more than that. So a seven-day supply is all that it's allowed to be prescribed for acute pain. And the dose has to be what we call below 30 morphine equivalent dosing, unless there's certain requirements that are met where the patient has been on other medications before. And then chronic pain is what we're really going to be talking about today is before prescribing, uh, there, has, there are quite a few hoops to be looked at. So the HMP needs to include the evaluation of previous treatments, screening for substance abuse or misuse, substance abuse disorder, uh, making sure we have the pertinent labs, the ORS check, the functional uh, pain assessment, and then to develop a treatment plan, do informed consent with the patient and make sure that they know how to store it and dispose of it as well. And then for as the doses of the um, opioid that we use go up, there are more morphine equivalent dosing is what that MED stands for, and 80, then we do definitely have to have um, not only a pain contract, but we also have to offer a prescription for the naloxone. Um, and once we get above 80, um, I guess between 50 and 80, we consider it. Above 80, we have to offer the naloxone and, and also uh, document that. And above 120 morphine equivalent dosing, uh, it's required that there is a pain or, or hospital uh, hospice specialist that is consulted, which sometimes is hard be, depending on where the patient's located and the availability of those specialists. Um, there are a variety of other things that we are looking for, mandatory checking of ORs. Um, we do have to have the ICD-10 code on the prescription. Benzodiazepines uh, now have a block, black box warning that says to, states to avoid concurrent use of the benzos and opioids because there's additive respiratory depression. <coughs> and then really for any prescription, we're not really allowed to transfer that prescription, <coughs> excuse me, to someone else. And I have run into quite a few insurance companies that require a prior off for opioids. So you can see there's lots of rules and regulations these days and what that all adds up to is at times we do see those opioids not being used or suddenly stopped um, in some patients. And I think for most patients, they can get by with a sudden stopping of, of medication. Most younger patients, uh, they will be uncomfortable. They may have some nausea, vomiting, some diarrhea, mostly GI effects. But in our older patients, there are more um, symptoms of withdrawal that we see. So like many things in our older patients, whatever there is a side effect of, they are going to get more of that side effect so that nausea, vomiting, diarrhea can cause some dehydration that may even lead them into the hospital. And then unlike younger patients who usually don't have a whole lot of CNS effects with a sudden stopping of an opioid, our older patients will oftentimes have CNS effects and might even get delirious with that. So uh, just that caution of, I don't think that when, um, when all these laws were made, it just creates a 
few more hoops you have to jump through makes it a little bit harder to give these medications and being careful not to let patients run out of their opioid because of some of these things that might not be met. So the CDC talks about indications for tapering and discontinuation of opioids. So to start out with a uh, part of that monitoring that is now part of the law does say that we need to make sure that the patient has sustained clinical meaningful improvement in their pain and function. So the idea of giving these medications are to improve function. So that's an important part uh, that we wanna make sure that we are seeing that the patients do achieve that. Um, if the patient's taking opioid doses greater than the 50 milligrams of, excuse me, 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day, that's a reason for us to think twice about um, should we help with achieving that pain. If they're on concurrent benzodiazepines that cannot be tapered, that's a reason that the CDC feels that we should think about discontinuing, tapering the, the opioid off. If the patient requests a dosage reduction, then certainly at that point, we do want to taper it off as well. And then if the patient experiences overdose um, or an other adverse event related to the opioid, that would be another reason that we would consider tapering that medication off. So how do you take people off of opioids? So um, like I said, sudden stop used to be fairly acceptable, probably um, not as dangerous in younger patients as it is in older patients. But in both populations, the CDC is now recommending to taper the doses off. There's a variety of ways to do it. I have them listed up here. Decrease the dose by five to 20% every four weeks or by 10% every week to month. So you can see there's a wide variety of um, methods and I don't think any of them have been very well studied, surprisingly, with knowing how long opioids have been out and used. Um, and then you do need to be uh, alert to those patients that actually may be addicted to their opioids and those patients will probably need some medication assisted treatment. Uh, usually with methadone, naltrexone, or buprenorphine are the meds we use uh, to help patients get off of opioids when they're actually addicted to the medication. So, and that is normally through a treatment program. And you do need, to, I think it's important to be aware that we do, our older patients can still get addicted. So we might have to do that. Uh, CDC also recommends to prescribe something else for pain. They recommend the acetaminophen one gram Q8. Um, prescribe something for the diarrhea that's likely to occur with opioid um, withdrawal, which is loperamide. And then they recommend promethazine. Um, for older patients, they have more side effects from promethazine to use for nausea. So we would normally use odansetron instead. All right, so that's a bit about, um, about opioids. So our older patients, as I said before, are a population that has a lot of pain. So what do we do for these patients? How do we treat the pain? So just a little bit about pain. We have acute pain and chronic pain, and we're gonna talk mostly about chronic pain. And chronic pain can be divided into nociceptive. Nociceptive is a pretty common type of, prior, of um, pain that our older patients um, will experience that would have to do with any type of tissue damage or any damage that is more in the organs that you're going to feel that um, sense of pain. So a very common type of pain. Neuropathic pain affects the nerves as, it, as, um, as it's listed. And then I am here seeing in the literature a lot about psychological pain. And then psychological pain from what I can take from the literature is something that seems like there's a lot of patients that have that and that really from the pain or they had prior to the pain that may be contributing to their perception of the pain. That idea of mixed pain where oftentimes, and I would say in our older patients, very oftentimes, it's not just one kind of pain. There's a lot of different types of pain that are going on. And then I did add to this that I wanted to at least mention the idea of hyperalgesia. And this is something um, fairly new, you know, within the last five years, they've started to talk about that for a subpopulation, for a reason that we don't really understand very well, 
is that the pain receptors with opioid use that is prolonged become actually more sensitive to pain. So although the opioids may initially seem like they're helping with pain, the opioids actually worsen the pain with time. And you get into this situation where you give more opioids because the pain isn't better and the pain actually gets worse. So that is something to watch out for because certainly it is something that does occur. So talking a little bit about the pain assessment, that is cer certainly an important part of what we do when we talk about pain. So uh, if you can get a history, when did the pain start? Was it related to an injury? Certainly doing that physical exam, uh, looking for points of inflammation, uh, deciding if it has a muscular component or an, and a neuro neurological evaluation as well should go with that. And then also that psychosocial evaluation, so depression and anxiety screens as well. Um, this is a method that I've used for quite some time to help to evaluate for pain. It's a pretty quick way that you can help get some idea of what's going on with the patient um, specifically about pain. So asking about the PQRSTU is just a quick way to remember the things you should be asking somebody that has a lot of pain. So P is palliating or provoking activities. So what makes it better? What makes it worse? What is the quality of the pain? So oftentimes I ask for the patient to describe the pain to me. Uh, sometimes they have a hard time putting words into, um, so I might give them some choices. Is it, is it achy? Is it shooting? Those types of things relate to quality. Region is, is exactly where is the pain. So oftentimes, you know, point to me where it hurts. Um, score is for S. So what is the pain score? Usually we use a scale between zero and 10 with zero, no pain, and 10 being the worst possible pain. T is the temporal association. So um, what activities may contribute um, to the pain or is there any time of the day that you feel the pain is better or worse? And then U stands for what the pain means to you. So how um, does it affect that person's life? So when I think about the effects of persistent pain, there are quite a few effects of persistent pain. And this is a diagram that I've used in teaching um, quite a, for quite some time. But in an older patient, especially, uh, probably more in a younger patient, but uh, maybe not. Depression, oftentimes with insomnia in our older patients. And this is the part that I think is more um, leaning towards an older patient is that decreased ambulation that occurs because of this as well. So it all leads basically to um, functional decline. So in many times by the time that I am seeing the patient, I'm not sure which started first. You know, what really started? Did the pain start first? Did the anxiety depression start first? But I think it's important to understand they're all interrelated and treating each of these will probably have some effect on each other. So when we talk about older patients and some of the considerations when evaluating and treating chronic uh, pain in older patients are that many chronic illnesses may contribute to the pain. So when we think about, um, I think diabetes is something that comes up a, a lot of times and our patients will have some neuropathic pain. So getting their diabetes under better control will oftentimes help their pain. So that is one example. CHF is oftentimes related to pain, it's uncomfortable um, to have excess fluid. And so looking for those types of things that may be contributing to their pain and taking care of their underlying illness is an important part of trying to uh, handle the chronic pain that our older patients sometimes have. Um, also the cognitive impairment piece, that is definitely a big issue with communicating pain. So especially if there's some significant cognitive impairment, um, our patients may not be able to communicate that they are uncomfortable and where they are uncomfortable. Uh, it is good to use some of those alternate pain scales that are out there. And I have an example of one on the next slide I'll show you uh, that basically have the faces. So our patient with cognitive impairment can point to how they're feeling. And then looking for clues such as grimacing, moaning, increased heart rate and blood pressure. Those would be clues that the patient that can't communicate well is at least we know that they're in pain. We might not know where. 
Um, we also know that many older patients uh, don't really want to state that they have pain. And I would say this is uh, especially uh, true for our generation that's over 80 right now, that especially older men, I think that they try to be very stoic and they try not to um, let people know that they're having pain. So um, wording how you ask, so maybe not using the word pain, might help you find out more of where the patient is. I've sometimes said uncomfortable, or you get feeling tingling or numbness to try to get out, because um, sometimes they just don't want to share that with you. Um, we need to keep in mind, of course, that many older patients are sensitive to the adverse effects of medications, and we have to watch out for that. And then as we talked about, the economic and regulatory barriers to pain control. Um, and I think really this was not well covered in medical school or in pharmacy school, actually. Um, more it's only been in the last 10 or 20 years where this has become a very uh, prominent part of the curriculum. So making sure that we know that um, prescribers as well as pharmacists may not have been well trained in this. And then also knowing that chronic pain is certainly associated with functional impairments. So making sure that we uh, treat the pain will hopefully help um, improve function for the patient. And this is just a picture, I couldn't fit it on the slide, but the Wong Baker faces is kind of the classic one that we use when we are talking to cognitively impaired patients who aren't really able to tell us for sure that they're in pain. All right, so like most things, I always would prefer to use non-pharmacological methods uh, to treat any uh, disease state and, or um, situation rather than using drugs. And we have quite a few things that we can do non-pharmacological. So uh, certainly counseling um, is something that has some evidence about showing that it does help to uh, with pain. So in particular, counseling for depression and anxiety, uh, using mindfulness, guided imagery, and biofeedback that also has some pretty decent literature that shows that that does work and helps to decrease pain. It's hard to find somebody that will do that uh, for you to actually refer to somebody for that. But some of the people that help with depression and anxiety also use that. Um, getting a pastoral care provider involved, I think there's a lot of that pain that might be due to unresolved situations that may have occurred in that patient's life, maybe with family members or someone else. And having that person, um, if they are spiritual, being able to talk to somebody um, about that has also been shown to help with pain. So physical therapy and exercise is usually the last thing people want to hear about when they're in pain, but definitely uh, good literature to show that being involved with daily exercise as well as uh, the physical therapy um, is something that will improve pain. Massage, weight loss programs, oftentimes pain, especially for older patients, may be to joint pain and, and losing weight can help with that. Uh, cold and heat, TENS, and then acupuncture and acupuncture. And I just came across something kind of by accident recently that um, I at least saw that acupressure is covered by Medicare. I'm not sure of the specifics, but I did see, and that might be something um, that I think is worth investigating more on. All right, let me see how I can move things. It's not moving. For some reason, I'm frozen. All right, so what are some of the common non-opioid medications uh, that older patients tolerate fairly well? Anybody wanna put that in the chat? Tylenol. Okay, yes. Tylenol is being the base of what we wanna to try to do. It's usually our first step. Um, definitely effective for osteoarthritis. If there's an inflammatory component to the pain, not so much. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. We can't expect everybody uh, to respond to acetaminophen. Uh, for instance, somebody that has rheumatoid arthritis, I wouldn't expect them to get much out of the Tylenol. And just a couple of pearls for geriatric considerations. 
is 3,000 milligrams per day in divided doses. We usually go one gram Q8 or 650 Q6. If you have somebody that seems like they improve uh, when they take a medication, a little bit more of a placebo effect that, but if it helps them to take it more times a day, I would think about doing that. Um, for many patients, every six hours is hard to take a, a dose that often. Um, definitely and, more- NSAIDs or Celebrex was also added to the chat. Okay, good. So it's definitely, um, acetaminophen is more efficacious when given scheduled. Uh, nobody's, somebody has finally done the study that showed that, that if you give scheduled acetaminophen, pain relief is better. Uh, they didn't really relate it to drug levels, but I, I think maybe that you might need to have uh, a basically get to a steady state level that will work better, usually for scheduled Tylenol two or three days before you see the full effects of that. Uh, I find many older patients very fearful of taking acetaminophen. Um, again, this tends to be in the group that is around 80-ish or older, that they just are afraid that they might uh, take too much acetaminophen and that's gonna harm um, their liver. And sometimes they say their kidney, but you know, Back when they found that when acetaminophen was first um, released, there wasn't a max dose on it. And those uh, patients probably found out, saw the information that was published about uh, in the newspaper that people were dying from acetaminophen. And that may be the reason why they have that fear. So making sure they understand that we don't give those real high doses like they gave when it first came out. And it does have that potential interaction with warfarin. I think if a patient's on warfarin, you wanna schedule the acetaminophen. Using acetaminophen just as needed probably is gonna be equal to um, variable INR. So it's if they're gonna take less than six doses of acetaminophen per week, then you don't have the interaction, but there are a couple studies that show more than six doses of uh, acetaminophen, and that's per week, not per day, then you're going to actually um, end up with having uh, some types of effect on your INR. And I certainly have seen that many times. Oh boy, I'm not sure what's going on with these slides, why I can't change them all of a sudden. Hmm. All right, so the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, so I did hear that those are, that's a drug that we use in older patients as well. And yes, we do. Uh, it does have a higher incidence of adverse effects in older patients. So if things to do, and we want to generally use it for short term, um, not for long term. I don't have it on the slide, but if we do have a situation where we have to use a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for a long time, term, then it is recommended to use a proton pump inhibitor to at least protect from the GI bleeding that might occur. So our biggest issue with using these meds in older patients is there's a much higher risk of GI bleeding in our older patients compared to our younger patients. Um, I did have a study from long ago that rated that as uh, 12 times higher in patients over the age of 75 when you compare it to younger patients less than 65. Increased risk of renal impairment. Also, we know that these drugs will increase the risk for cardiovascular and cerebral vascular risk, um, actually contraindicated in patients with CHF. So lots of reasons why these aren't our safest drugs in older patients, but we do use uh, diclofenac gel because diclofenac gel has a high, fairly high concentration at the site where it's applied, but not uh, that very much, about 6% is actually, 6 to 12% is actually absorbed into the body. Uh, we have a lot less of the systemic side effects from that medication. So one thing that you have to be um, a little bit careful about is being specific with a max dose for that diclofenac gel. I have run into patients who say this worked great for me and I'm putting it everywhere. Um, so you have to not do that, not in every single joint. I think they say the maximum amount would be uh, four grams put, um, four grams used four times a day. So if you want to divide that up uh, uh, between joints, but not to exceed that amount. Antidepressants, some things that we know with antidepressants is the SNRIs. Certainly those are medications that we go to a lot for pain. Um, 
probably most often duloxetine because it's less likely to cause withdrawal than the other common one in that class, which is uh, venlafaxine. Uh, we do need to watch for hypertension. They can increase the blood pressure, usually just moderately, I mean, just a little bit. When I say a little bit, the systolic goes up by five points. Uh, it can cause liver dysfunction. So duloxetine, um, that is a side effect that I suspect might occur more in older patients. That's not in the literature, but from my experience, it seems like it occurs um, more than I would expect it to by what the uh, information in the literature is. So uh, making sure that we check liver enzymes when we start it and watch for that liver enzyme increase. It is reversible. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, they have the anticholinergic effects. So although they work very well for, for pain, especially for neuropathic pain, we do know that they have all those anticholinergic side effects. So cognitive decline, falls, constipation, urinary retention. Uh, nortriptyline is a secondary amine. So any secondary amines have less of those anticholinergic effects. So that could be a possibility, but if the patient's on a lot of drugs with anticholinergic those are drugs like sertraline. Um, they really don't have any efficacy in the treatment of pain. You need the norepinephrine part of it, which is the SNRIs to see the effect on pain. Anticonvulsants, uh, really primarily for neuropathic pain is where we have used these gabapentin and pregabalin are really our classic drugs that we use. There are other anticonvulsants that do have some effect on on pain, carbonazepine is probably um, one that is occasionally used and topiramide occasionally used as well. Um, we wanna start with low doses and wean up slowly. Both of these medications can cause some sedation. Um, they also cause peripheral edema and both that sedation and peripheral edema is more in patients who are in high doses. Um, so high doses of gabapentin, and um, that's described at least in this, this one study is greater than 900 milligrams per day, that should say, um, it can increase the risk for opioid overdose. So that is just really one study that was a large um, study that basically looked at factors that contributed to an opioid overdose. And one of the factors was being on a gabapentin dose greater than 900 milligrams per day. So definitely not a cause effect type of study, but enough patients in there to at least mention that is something to think about. We want to watch for uh, gait and vision disturbances as well um, for these drugs, because if the dose is high, you can have some issues with both gait and vision like you can for many of the anticonvulsants. Um, and we already talked about the drowsiness and peripheral edema. Local anesthetics, uh, lidocaine jelly or local nerve blocks are something that we could use. Uh, so a lidocaine patches, uh, not covered by insurance usually anymore because they are available in a slightly different um, strength available as OTC. Uh, so those can get a fact, lidocaine jelly tends to be a little bit, or cream tends to be a little bit cheaper and may be able to better get to the spot where the patient is actually having some pain. Um, as far as using the uh, local, the topical local anesthetic for something like back pain, it probably doesn't go deep enough to actually see effects with that. Other topicals would be counter irritants like menthol or camphor, and they actually have studies that have shown that those do work for pain as well. And then the capsaicin cream, the one thing I need to caution not only older patients, but everybody about with the capsaicin cream is avoid contact with eyes or mucous membranes because it can cause a lot of burning. So people should wear gloves when they're putting it on. Um, muscle relaxants. So most of the muscle relaxants, the drugs like cyclobenzaprine, are, is probably one of the most common ones. Uh, Carisprodol is another one. And methocarbamol, those are the three common ones. So that is Soma, Robaxin, and constipation, urinary retention in our older patients. Tizanidine is usually our go-to drug for muscle relaxants in older patients, um, but it's not without side effects. So it can still cause some orthostasis, especially if you start with the 
dose that is recommended for a younger patient. So usually the tizanidine start with two milligrams instead of the four milligrams. I've heard, I have read that um, some suggest two milligrams once a day rather as being the starting dose for that to kind of, to make sure that the patient tolerates it. Corticosteroid joint injections, those are also uh, something that can be very helpful um, for our older patients. So the idea is that the steroid stays uh, primarily just in the joint, so limited absorption, so limited systemic side effects. Although if, if there is, if you have a diabetic patient, it is a good idea to keep an eye on the sugars because certainly some of it doesn't just stay in the joint and you sometimes can see sugars go up fairly high after a steroid injection. Cannabinoids, um, I thought I would include this because there's been quite a bit published about this recently, but what's been published is actually that really the evidence is for efficacy continues to be sparse and we still don't have good studies that show us whether these uh, drugs will have adverse effects in our older patients that will lead to falls and other functional declines. So um, I think that there's more and more studies being done now that there is some legal ways to get the study started. So it might be something that we would uh, be using maybe those cannabinoids that tend to have less CNS effects might end up having some um, efficacy. And I didn't include it in here, but I certainly um, have heard a lot about the topical uh, CBD oil. And that seems like uh, it does help some patients, but again, no studies that really tell us that. All right. So that went through all of the um, of the non-opioid choices that we have. So when should we consider using opioids? When would you think about we should actually try an opioid for this patient? Anything in the chat there? I'm looking. Nothing yet. Uh, okay. when, they tried, when they tried everything else and nothing works. Yep, that's pretty much it. After so, major surgery. Yes. So, so especially for chronic, and definitely we would use opioids. Um, they are trying to sometimes not use opioids after major surgery, but I think at least for the first few days, they often still do. Um, but if you have pain in spots, spite of non-opioid pain treatments, and really when you think about that, I think about what is the pain? What does that pain mean to that patient? So back to that PQRSTU, the U part of it. So really coming up with the idea of weighing the benefit of using the opioid versus the risk. And when the benefits move more, to have them be able to actually interact better with their family um, and maybe be able to take care of themselves better. So there so were a couple other um, short-term acute pain and then Someone else said when they've gone to pain management and they've exhausted all of their efforts. So I just yes. To... Yeah, we, so certainly we don't want to um, hit the button on using the opioids before we've tried at least some of the other things that we've talked about, but you will get to that point in some patients where uh, really there isn't anything else that's working. And at least in my opinion, I don't feel right about not offering somebody a drug that might help them. Um, because of the opioid crisis. But we do have to be careful about weighing the risk. So the disease risk I would say that would, should be considered would be, does this patient have a reason why they are going to be especially sensitive to the adverse effects of the opioids? So we talked about some of those adverse effects, probably the biggest one is the respiratory depression, or maybe we haven't talked about that yet, but we talk about the disease risk that you know, is there something going on? Does this patient have bad COPD that will make them more sensitive to respiratory depression? Medication risks. Are they on other drugs that cause respiratory depression? The benzodiazepines are the classic group. Um, and then we start to think about, do they have potentials for opioid uh, misuse? And these are basically the uh, potentials that for opioid misuse that are mentioned in the um, Literature would be uh, social isolation, social problems, history of substance abuse, history of mental illness, or family history of substance abuse. 
And there really are some um, screeners that we can use. And I have a couple of them listed up there with a website for one of them. Uh, the soap screen and the comm screen are the two most common ones that help us decide if that patient is going to be at an especially high risk for using the opioids. And then our next step is really talking to the patient about what they think is going to, uh, they'll get out of using the opioid. So making sure that the goals of therapy make sense. So um, it's very rare that we get to the point that we're going to use opioids and we would expect the opioid to completely take away the pain. So chronic pain is hard to completely get rid of. So making sure that the patient's aware of that, uh, making sure they understand how the medication will be taken, how it will be prescribed, the rules and regulations that are out these days about it, the fact that they can't take an extra dose, um, they would need to call and come up with some other idea, uh, but they can't just take an extra dose on their own. And their expectation for both follow-up and monitoring. So just because the patient's older doesn't mean uh, we don't have to do urine um, screens. So we still do urine screens in those patients and we don't want them to get offended when we ask for them to basically pee in a cup so we can see that the opioid is actually there as it should be. And if is, is preferred, rather than having the PCP um, manage that medication, but sometimes there's a lot of barriers to that. So uh, before we get to that really high dose opioids, oftentimes uh, the PCP is taking care of the pain. So what are our safest opioids for older adults? Anybody have any ideas on that? Looking. Okay. What did you uh, say? Tramadol, tramadol. So morphine and tramadol. So certainly ones we see a lot in our older patients. Um, so I call these the do nots. So these are the ones that have more geriatric considerations. And it's not really that you can't use them in older patients, but just that there are more issues with them. So starting out with codeine and codeine is an old drug. Every once in a while, you do come across somebody that's still using a Tylenol number three, uh, but more GI adverse effects and basically patients with renal impairment. A lot of our older patients are prone uh, as they age to have renal impairment, then they, that codeine is going to um, cause some metabolites that will cause a few problems. Um, for fentanyl patches, um, we can't use them in opioid naive patients. We can't use them in patients that don't have um, much muscle or fat because they are going to, we need to have that fat layer for them to be absorbed correctly. For opioid naive patients, um, we used to be able to use them in opioid naive patients, but there were quite a few patients where it was reported that they had an adverse event related to doing that. So starting with an opioid patch before they were on anything else. And now they do recommend that a patient's on equivalent to 60 milligrams of oral morphine or um, 20 milligrams of IV morphine before you would start a fentanyl patch. Morphine, the toxic metabolites can accumulate in patients with renal impairment. So if you have somebody uh, that does have good renal function, then it's okay to use morphine. But if you're going to put somebody on something that they're probably going to stay on for longer term, might not want to go with morphine just because of the fact that as they age, we might need to decrease um, that dose. Now, morphine tends to be most one of the most cost-effective medications. So as long as you're watching to decrease that dose, uh, it is something that would be okay to use, but just to watch for that. Meperidine, uh, that one also has a lot of side effects in patients with renal dysfunction, uh, one of those being seizure risk, another being serotonin syndrome. Um, it doesn't offer a whole lot of advantages. I know at SUMA where I work that we only use meperidine now um, one or two doses in recovery room because it does help with shivering, but it's not really on formulary. And it is something that I would avoid in older patients. Um, so methadone, methadone, very effective for older patients, but a little bit tricky dosing. So better to really um, get some experience with dosing methadone. I wouldn't say that it's something to, to start out with just until, again, until the next appointment. It requires monitoring to make sure 
uh, that the methadone is not accumulating. Oftentimes when we give methadone, you're not gonna get uh, the full effect of that for two or three weeks. And then you're gonna need to start backing off on that dose. So that's some, just something to be aware of. Uh, tramadol and tapenadol, which um, is still expensive. We don't use much tapenadol, but those both kind of are in the same group. So seizure and serotonin syndrome are um, something that can occur when you use it with serotonergic medications. So always my caution with using tramadol, it does have the advantages that it does work some for neuropathic pain, like the methadone maybe works a bit better for the neuropathic pain, but it has that disadvantage that you can't um, add. If you add an antidepressant, you have to be very careful that the patient to watch for side effects of serotonin syndrome. And I guess I've seen enough patients admitted with seizures after that has been done that it makes me a little bit worried when we do that. I'm not sure why my, <laughs> there we go. All right, so these are the drugs that I think are a little bit safer opioid wise. Um, so buprenorphine patch or the film they also have, that's probably our most, our safest opioid that we have for our older patients. It has a cap on the respiratory depression. So especially if you're just starting out, um, that is a medic on an opioid. Um, that's when you most often will see the respiratory depression um, occur. So that would be a medication that we would be uh, more likely to do well with in our older patients. Hydrocodone, uh, that's the opioid part of Norco, but the issue with it is if to use it alone, it's expensive. So if we do use it, we would use it with acetaminophen. And oftentimes we want to give the acetaminophen on a scheduled basis as a base, and you'd rather be able to give them um, the opioid um, separately so they use less of the opioid. Um, so not, um, ne necessarily the first choice, but would be okay. Hydromorphone, um, it is more potent, so you have to be careful of the dose that is used. So hydromorphone, the other name is dilated, and that would be another one to, to make sure that you're careful about the dosing. I put methadone in the dues also because I do think it does have some advantage in our older patients, but like I said before, you need to know how to dose it. And then oxycodone, there is a less renal elimination with oxycodone. So that's oftentimes our go-to drug in our older patients is oxycodone, especially if we have somebody that's bordering on that chronic clearance of less than 30, where you have to be careful with the morphine, um, the oxycodone, we're not needing to be as careful or as worried about the uh, renal accumulation of metabolites. And then even a tramadol and tapenadol, I did put also. So if the patient older patients. I don't know, Denise, if you're doing the next slide, but <laughs> I don't know why this one uh, advanced for me. All right. Um, so other uh, geriatric considerations for opioids is remember that the opioid receptor um, is one of those areas as when we age that that receptor becomes more sensitive. So we're always gonna start with lower doses and we wanna increase the dose slowly. And looking at the lower doses, uh, these are recommended doses for an opioid naive older patient. So you can see the morphine oral dose is five to 10 milligrams. Oxycodone is 2.5 instead of five, 2.5 to five instead of five to 10. You also want to um, adjust opioids a little bit slower. So consider adjusting by increasing the dose by 25 to 50 percent instead of the 50 to 100 percent that we usually do when we're working with younger patients. And remember, if we're changing from one opioid to another, that there is this incomplete cross tolerance. So if the patient's pain was under good control, and, but we need to adjust, the, to change the medication, that's usually, from my experience, is usually because it's not paid for by the insurance anymore, then we want to decrease that dose by 25 to 50% and then titrate back up if we need to. Opioid monitoring, weekly at initiation, then at least every three months, you wanna monitor for side effects, hyperalgesia and abuse and misuse. 
And these are all the different adverse effects that can occur from opioids, respiratory depression, hypotension, constipation, confusion, uh, itching more with some opioids, such as morphine more than others. And then of course that hyperalgesia is an important thing uh, to monitor as well. Um, so the respiratory depression, hypotension are more likely with high doses or when you change doses. Um, you oftentimes do get tolerant to most of these side effects except for the constipation. So most patients on um, opioids will be constipated and we usually have to use a uh, stimulant laxative. So when we're monitoring for misuse and abuse, um, this, these are the things that are suggested. This is actually what's suggested in the regulations is to watch for excessive mood swings, hostility, a new increase or decrease in sleep, taking higher doses than prescribed, evidence of new poor decision-making, appearing high, requesting early refills or losing uh, prescriptions and seeking prescriptions from more than one prescriber. So that is part of what we do when we prescribe opioids for anyone, including older patients, is to monitor for these things and make sure that we're not seeing signs that uh, the patient is actually misusing or abusing the medication. I think misusing is something that you can correct um, with discussion, the abusing, oftentimes they will need to be referred to a treatment center if we actually get to the point that it is more of an abuse type situation. And we think the Joint Commission in 2001 said we should be treating pain. That's important to treat pain. And then these days we kind of got to the opioid crisis where we're, I think a lot of people are not using opioids um, anywhere near as much, which is good, but in some patients it may be bad. And we need to get back to that middle where we are um, using the opioids, but being careful about picking our population carefully and also monitoring. So I went a little bit longer than I suspected was planning on it. I'm not sure if we still have time for the case, uh, but what questions do you have for me? Sorry, there are a couple questions. One from earlier from Janet was, is there less interaction with acetaminophen warfarin than with NSAIDs? Um, I would say it's a different type of interaction, but I would say yes. So. So if I have a patient on warfarin, I would not use a non -steroidal. So you're gonna increase your risk for bleed with that. So it would be, I would be very hesitant to use a non -steroidal. I won't say I won't use it ever, but very hesitant to use a non -steroidal. As opposed with acetaminophen, that's an interaction that can be managed. It's best managed by giving the acetaminophen on a scheduled basis. So, you know, whatever dose you might want to use to use that twice a day, three times a day, but to get the dose scheduled, so then the warfarin dose is adjusted based on that. Another question, what are the recommendations for non-osteoarthritis, like rheumatoid or psoriatic? Yeah, I did not cover that. I thought about doing that. I would say that's a whole nother uh, area, but I think it's a very good question. Um, so certainly in something that I feel like I run into quite a bit is the choices for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis have certainly exploded. There's lots of new drugs that are in the market that uh, have really good efficacy and decent safety. So making sure that a patient actually gets evaluated uh, by a specialist. So usually those drugs can only be prescribed by a rheumatologist, I think can make a big difference. Um, so a lot of pain that is more inflammatory, either rheumatoid or psoriatic, with or without markers, will be able to be taken care by some of these other drugs that are out. Um, so getting an evaluation is an important thing. We have one more question from Kent asking, what's the course of action if they actually are out of their medication prior to refill date? So that is one of the things that, um, that I think is up to the physician. So certainly the physician would have to do um, documentation, the documentation uh, from my understanding of the law, and I have read these all of these laws pretty closely, is, and the documentation is probably the most important part so that the physician doesn't get in trouble, is to make sure that the physician does that
of their opioid and they have risk of withdrawal of having uh, confusion or dehydration and that a small amount, it could be a amount that would be just enough to prevent withdrawal. So a lower dose than what the patient was on before will be prescribed and that the physician will uh, basically uh, discuss get this with the, the patient to ensure it doesn't happen again. So I think that that is, um, you know, I'm not the one prescribing, so it's easy for me to, to say that, but I do feel that that would be a way to do it that doesn't harm the patient. Because I do feel that a lot of patients end up in the hospital when they're just cut off of their opioid. I have definitely seen that. All right. And then one last comment that came through and then we'll be done is um, Jen comment <clears throat> on the schedule of acetaminophen and said how true your presentation was. She said, There's a patient um, when she takes the acetaminophen, it works well for her. Uh, she doesn't want it to not work when I really need it. Uh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I truncated that. She's well beyond her beyond 90, who always says she isn't in enough pain to take an acetaminophen, but calls about once a week to report how much pain she's in. So she's saying it actually does work, so. Yes, and that 90 year old group, I mean, 80 to 90 are the group that I feel they, they are scared to death of acetaminophen. So, you know, I think giving examples to patients about all the patients that you're involved with that use the acetaminophen and haven't ever had a side effect. And yeah, those side effects are real common if you take, like they used to, people used to take eight grams a day, but you know, not so much when we're doing this, just three grams, no more than three grams a day. So it is one of those things. <laughs> Definitely, I've run into it a lot too. All righty, well, thank you everyone for joining us.